Let's bow together. Father, there's so much to be thankful for. You call us to that. You command us to that. You expect that from us. We do that today. We show it in gathering in this place. Among the things we thank you for is the rain that you have sent to us. Father, another reminder and affirmation that you provide for us. You give us that which we need and you sustain us. And when we come to this place, we express our gratitude to you and the hearts that we bring and the attention that we give to your word and the openness that we have to responding to that and living a transformed life. We thank you that you are there to hear our prayer. We're thankful that you are ever faithful and that you answer in your way, which is always best for us. So we ask that you bless this time that we have here, that you find it pleasing, and we do that in your son's name. Amen. Perhaps some of our children other children think, might even say, you know, that pastor sure prays a lot. You know what? I hope they say that. I mean, they're in in church and they hear me pray and they see me pray and in other settings, but I hope that's genuinely their belief. The reality is that there are prayer warriors outside these doors who pray much more than me. But I share that with you because I hope you know that you remain a part of my prayers. When I pray, and the attitude of prayer that God tells us in which we are to walk, that you are in my thoughts and you are in my prayers. And that's not a phrase that I throw around insincerely. Regrettably, in today's world, often the response to situations is, oh, we'll pray about that, or they need our prayers, or they have our prayers. And to be honest with you, there are occasions in which I just wonder, did you really pray? I do. You know, when I I go through the Bible, often I find myself in in the latter parts of the books, often the letters that Paul wrote, even the other books of the Bible. It's kind of the yours truly part, you know. It's right at the very end. And and we have a tendency sometimes to get to that part of a a book of the Bible and we just skip on to the next place we're going to read, and we really shouldn't. Because every word in this book is important and it comes from God. And often in the closing words of these chapters, there are just such great lessons to be learned if we just spend some time there. Recently I was doing that. Sometimes I just go and I'll read through the very ending portions of these books. And I was doing that and I came across something at the conclusion of Hebrews. And it really struck me. In fact, it struck me in such a way that I thought this could be captioned the pastor's prayer. And it's the passage from which I want to share with you today. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And there in the closing words of this book, which God has given to us, is just a, a great prayer that contains great lessons. And I want to share from that today. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm going to share verses 20 and 21, and then we'll go back and and look at them. It says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, when I read through that, I said, wow, what a simple and and straightforward prayer, but one that should reflect the heart of every single pastor. And not only is this what I'm called to pray, it's also a great insight into the very heart of God for what he desires for every single one of his children. And there's some strong lessons here about prayer in the heart of God, and I want to share from those this morning. So look back at verse 20. And it says this, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. 
Now, as I often share, I don't like to overlook any words that are in a particular verse. And this one begins with two important words. It says, now may. And what those say is, this is a very specific request. It's not something that's just thrown out there. It's not something, well, I'm out of stuff to say, so it's time to go. It's a very heartfelt, straightforward, direct prayer that addresses a request to a God of limitless power. You know, I got a list of things that really bug me. I shared a few with these kids. My wife says my list is too long. But here's one that really bugs me. When I hear some, a phrase, we all worship the same God. When I hear somebody say, whether you call him Yahweh or Allah or Buddha, it's all the same. No, he's not. The God of the Bible is not the God of other religions. The God of all creation is not the God of man-made creations. And it's ever important in times of specific prayer and in the constant attitude of prayer that we're called to maintain, that we recognize and acknowledge that we call upon the one true God. You see, in doing that, we're acknowledging not only his nature, but his limitless power. Notice what it said in verse 20. The God of peace who brought up the, our Lord Jesus from the dead. And when you walk through Paul's writings, as the Holy Spirit inspired him, he would refer to that and, and the power that God has. And, and I want you to turn over to uh, Ephesians, the first chapter. You know, I love it. You read Paul's letters and he's sending them out here. You know, we read them in the entirety, but he's sending them to churches and believers and they're going through them. And he would just put these prayers right in there to say, this is what I'm praying about for you. And in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance, his inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward, the, the, toward us who believe? Now listen to this. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ which he, when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Paul said, let me tell you something, friends in Ephesus, fellow believers. One, I'm praying for you, but understand this. I'm praying to the God of unique power who raised his son from the dead. It is so unique that no one else ever has, no one else will raise a divine human being from the dead. And this incredible power is the same power that we see working throughout Scripture. And it's the same power that Peter laid claim to when the Jew Jewish rulers called him before them to tell him, pardon me, shut up. Turn to Acts chapter 4. It's so critical that we understand when we speak to God, pray to God, live in a constant prayer with God, that this one that we are praying to is the unique God who has all power. In Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, it says this. It talks about the Jewish rulers. When they had set them in the midst, they, they asked, by what power, what name have you done this? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Remember last week? We prepared for the Lord's Supper. We shared about Peter, faith after failure. Peter who denied him 
three times. Peter, who found that faith after failure. And Peter, who now exhibits that faith that is grounded in the power of the resurrection. And it's evident throughout the accounts of Acts. Let me just share with this. Down in verse 33 of Acts 4. With great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. So we read that and we say, okay, what's the application for us? What's the application for me? Well, as your pastor, I need to be in constant memory that this God that we serve and worship and that I pray to for you is this God who has the power to resurrect. And it reminds me that as I pray for you, I have to pray in the power of that God, and it's no different for you. We don't enter into prayer and live in a constant attitude of prayer and and go around saying, well, I hope he hears me. I wonder if he hears me. I wonder if he's going to answer me. I wonder if he can even do anything about this. And when we don't see immediate answers or we don't see the answer we were expecting, the power of God and peace and the God, power of the God of the resurrection isn't lessened any. We don't need to approach God with half-hearted requests or hearts that hope he hears us and listens and answers us. You know, and as your pastor and a child of God, I remain ever thankful that as physical strength fails and emotions may be strained, God's limitless power is ever present. My prayers and your prayers have to always lay claim to that power and seek the fulfillment of God's plan in our lives. Look at the first part of verse 21. In this prayer, it says, He prayed that it would make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well pleasing in His sight. You know, often my mind goes to this setting right here. You know, I have a different view. I always wanted a church to put mirrors up here. Wouldn't that be cool? And you could see yourself. But I get to see you, you know, every Sunday, and, and, and I think about that, and in my mind I play back, and, and, and to be honest, I often play back, the, you know, who wasn't there and so forth. But, you know, I, I keep that image in my mind, and as... As I do, the writer of Hebrews says, as you see those whom you pastor, that your prayer should be that they do the good work that carries out God's will. And when you read this, I want you to know something. It, it, it's an all thing. There's not any, ex any exclusions in here. There's no what about me or if or anything else. It covers every single believer. Nobody's been grandfathered out of this prayer. And no one is above the scope of this prayer. So when I pray for you and you pray for God's will, what exactly does it mean? And, and you know, it's here that we often kind of go a bit astray. Not intentionally, but we do. Because, you see, we talk about God's will and we, we tend to reduce it down to a specific. That is, you know, where does God want me to go? Does God want me to do this? God, tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do next. And, and ultimately, that's not a bad prayer. But that's not the prayer that's being shared about here. You see, because often when we look at the trees, we miss the forest. And I'm convinced that God tells us directly that His will for us is to know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, and then to grow in our knowledge and understanding of Him. And He tells us that. Turn to Jeremiah 9. I wonder if a pastor ever said, you know, if you make them keep turning, they'll stay awake. <laughs> Jeremiah 9. And you know these verses, we sing them, verses 23 and 24. I mean, I never get tired of them. It, it's, Thus says the Lord. That, that's, when you see that in Scripture, that means pay extra attention. Thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Not let, 
Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Now listen carefully. That he understands and knows me. That I'm the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. I say, thank you so much, God. You tell us directly what your will for my life is in your life. He lays it right out there. He says, here's my will for your life as my child, that you know and understand me. You see, when I pray for you, my prayer is not that you like my sermon or that you think I'm a good pastor. My prayer doesn't begin with, I hope they find their place of service or I pray they're faithful in church attendance. Let me tell you what my prayer is. My prayer is that you grow in your knowledge and understanding of God. You see, when we do that, everything else is taken care of. I don't have to worry about the specifics of my life. If I'm growing in my intimacy with God, He is going to lead me to that because I'm going to understand Him better. And in doing that, I will listen and see and respond in obedience. He'll ultimately necessarily lead us to his will for our lives when we grow in that understanding and knowledge. And that's what's expressed in Ephesians 2.10. Listen to what it says. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God said, I prepared these works for you, and they are evidence that you're growing in your knowledge and understanding of me. And God gives us his will. You know, he even gives us a sequence of his will. He says, you need to grow in your knowledge and understanding of me. Then you will do the good works that I have prepared for you, and you will bear God-glorifying fruit when my Son abides in you and you abide in him. And that's my prayer. And it ought to be every believer's prayer. See, the prayer in Hebrew says, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. And I read that, and I couldn't help but think about a couple of verses in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 and 13, here's what it says. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, I mean, you know, people read that verse and they go, ooh, that means we got to work to be saved. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation in terms of regeneration through works. Ephesians makes it crystal clear that our relationship with God is made possible through his love and his grace when we accept in faith what he places out there. That's called regeneration. But you see, the salvation experience doesn't stop when we say my eternity is secure. It continues on as we grow, and we grow in our Christ-likeness. That's called sanctification. And so what we're told here is, as the pastor prays, as you pray, we pray for sanctification. We pray that we would be sanctified, consecrated, set apart to do his will. If you look at the Greek word that's used here for working out, it means to keep on working until completion or until fulfillment. It means that we don't lay claim to an eternity with God and then we just live this life unchanged. And to work out our salvation is not a passive attitude that sits back and basks in secure eternity. Remember how Paul, Paul said here, he described his spiritual life this way. He said, I'm running a race. You know, you don't run a race by standing still. He was constantly growing in that intimacy. Timothy was encouraged to pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. We're told in Galatians 5 that when we are growing in our knowledge and being filled with the Holy Spirit that we produce fruit, love, peace, joy, patience, gentleness, self-control, kindness, all kinds of things, several of which I'm still working on. But you see, that's what sanctification is all about. It's working out the full impact and understanding of a growing knowledge and understanding of God. 
And in simplest terms, my prayer, the pastor's prayer that's reflected here that should be is, you be sanctified. You know, that, that you grow. And as I've shared before, you know, to, to have 1,500 sitting in a church, to have 500 pictures of new members is wonderful. But folks, if there is not spiritual growth taking place, that's nothing. That's a number. And he says here exactly what he wants. To be set apart and consecrated to do that which brings glory to God. And we have the ultimate example to look to. Look at the last part of verse 21 of Hebrews 13. Through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, I, just, I just love, it's so divine how God does this. When he starts out, he talks about the God of peace. And when he gets to the end, he talks about Jesus Christ and the glory due him. The God of peace is a God who breaks down the wall through his son, Jesus Christ. A God who said a sinful humanity can never be in the presence of a sinless creator. A sinful humanity will never have the worth in and of themselves to, to overcome the death that is due for their rebellion. And so Jesus Christ does that for us. And what we could not do, God did through Jesus Christ. Last passage, turn to Colossians. First chapter of Colossians. And this is a great chapter that, that by itself could be captioned the supremacy of Christ. But Colossians chapter 1, as it shares about what Christ has done for us. In verses 19 and 20 it says, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You know, when I read Hebrews 13, 21, I'm just, I'm amazed that three words could mean so much. Through Jesus Christ. How they can encompass all of this life and all of eternity as well. Recognizing the the reconciliation and the peace that's made possible through Jesus Christ and praying in that peace, praying for that peace and for the one who became the substitute for our sinfulness and praying that he be glorified in every single thing we do. When I began today, I shared with you a reference that this is a prayer that I have for every single one of you. And I hope you see now that it's much more than just a casual reference or a pastoral remark. But you see, it's also a prayer that we should have for ourselves. My prayer for every believer here will always be that you grow in your knowledge and understanding of God, that God will use you to fulfill His will, that you abide in Christ and that you produce God-glorifying fruit, and that Jesus Christ be glorified in all that you do. And for everyone here, or anyone here, who hasn't laid claim to the salvation that God offers through His Son, Jesus Christ, my prayer for you is that you turn to the God of peace. And the conflict that you will never resolve yourself will be resolved in faith through Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your head.